Welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. Don't you think about Hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm thrilled you can join us today. Today, we are going to be talking about a novel at-home disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. And we're also going to talk about the HOPE study, um, which I'm very excited to learn more about. But prior to introducing our guests, I always like to do a couple of shout outs. So one, I want to let you know on October 10th, which will be here before we know it, um, I'll be out at Art of Senior Living in Woodbury, Minnesota, doing a program on Betty the Bald Chicken Lessons in How to Care. And you can RSVP to that. It'll be an evening program from five to six to Jana McCoy at 651 943 Two eight four zero, And then also September 28th and 29th, I will be part of the Geriatric Care Summit for 2023. You can just Google uh, Geriatric Care Summit. I'll be actually be doing the keynote on the 28th, and that'll be from 9 to 10. And the topic is Calibrating Care to Retain and Secure Staff and families. So I hope you can join us on both of those. And then of course, you can always go to alzheimerspeaks.com, go to our free educational resource tab. You can also go to our public events. Both are listed there uh, for more details as well. And you can also find your way to dementiamap.com, which is our global resource directory. And also another program that I'm doing with Lance Slayton of All's Home Cares Matters called Conscious Caregiving with Ellen L. And that's only a monthly episode, but we do hot topics and we dive deep with the panel and they're about two hour discussion. Very, very interesting. Our last one on end of life has over 275,000 views already and it's just been a week. So Uh, You can check out any of those from our site at alzheimerspeaks.com. Let's go ahead and introduce you to our guest today. Well, I am so excited to introduce our guest today. We have Dr. Ralph Kern with us. And um, Ralph, I'm going to have you go ahead and introduce yourself if you don't mind. Great, Lori. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, I'm a neurologist. Um, I spent the first half of my career as an academic neurologist leading a university department. Uh, Then I went into uh, biotechnology industry. And for the last 17 years, I have been developing treatments for uh, different types of brain diseases, including Alzheimer's. And uh, I am the chief medical officer at Cognito Therapeutics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, I've been with the company now for uh, over half a year, and uh, we are um, doing very interesting uh, work and hoping to help people with Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Fantastic. You know, I always ask every single one of my um, guests if they've been personally touched by dementia in their own family or circle of friends. So if you give us some insight, we'd appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, my my late mother suffered from Parkinson's disease, and she got it uh, a little bit later in life. But uh, you know, I think that's that's a condition that has an effect on cognitive function. I've had other family members with Alzheimer's disease. I've seen firsthand, and then of course, uh, practicing neurology for many many years, um, I had firsthand experience of how relentlessly progressive the disease is and how it affects uh, patients and their families. So yeah, I think I think I've I've seen the challenge that we're facing. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, my mom lived with dementia for 30 years. The first 10, it was kind of poo-pooed by her general GP as hormones. Um, but by the time, you know, her journey was over and we had her autopsy, uh, they said Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lewy body. And the neurologist said he had never seen a brain that small, you know, with that much shrinkage. But he said, that's what we should expect. But it is a difficult disease to, to pin down and, and really get some answers to. Yeah, you know, you, I, I'll twig on a couple of things you said. So first of all, I'm sorry, sorry that you had to go through that. But I think, you know, we all have that personal experience. A uh, couple of things that are, you know, emerging. Um, when I, when I was learning neurology and teaching it, uh, we thought Alzheimer's was a very simple and single uh, disorder. In fact, it, it's much more complicated, and uh, many people have more than just the Alzheimer's changes in the brain. And I think you're giving a really good example of that. The other is that one of the most constant features of Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases is as the disease advances and affects the components of the brain, in other words, the nerve cells, the, the wires in the brain that connect the different parts of the brain and the lining around those wires called myelin, we see the brain shrink. And I think that you're describing exactly the phenomenon that we think is really important. And that is um, not only um, does the disease advance in terms of function, in other words, can people do the things that they are that are important to them and their families and their day-to-day -day lives, and so-called activities of daily living and cognition, how people think and function in terms of how they are able to speak and reason. But also uh, there's a very there's a very consistent effect um, in the brain on the uh, loss of um, brain volume, so-called atrophy. And uh, at Cognito, we're we're trying to address both of those problems. And as I'll tell you soon, um, some of our data suggests that we can really target both of those and we can see consistent effects in both the, the function, how somebody does and how, how they feel, but also um, the more, more objective aspects of brain shrinkage and how can, what can one do about that? So I think those are two really important areas. I, I'm glad you've, you've brought them up because you're giving me ideas on what we can talk about today. Yeah, it's interesting. When the neurologist, like I said, saw her, her brain, he he kind of almost squealed and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, I shouldn't have done that. And then he said, but this is what we should expect. I mean, he was just absolutely stunned at it. And there are so many people out there that are living with the disease so long. And I, I know many doctors out there are still telling people five to seven years, but I am seeing a, a lot of people still functioning on the computer, participating in Zoom events that have been dealing with it 15 and 20 years. And I think we're going to see more of that as people get diagnosed earlier, you know, along the route here. And um, it's, it's a very different disease, I think, than what was projected when my mom, you know, first got her diagnosis, and everyone thought it was everyone just believed it was end stages only, you know, and it, and that's not the case. At yeah. all. So one thing one thing we're learning in our research studies is that early treatment makes a difference. And it doesn't just make a difference because um, it gets the treatment to the person who needs it sooner. I think early treatment may be more effective. And I think we need more rounds of evidence around that. But it does seem to be be the case uh, as a general rule. Uh, and of course, it needs to be established for every treatment individually separately. Um, the other is that, you know, one objective of Alzheimer treatments is to stabilize function and stabilize the loss of brain volume. So to, to slow down the rate of brain atrophy. And uh, if, if, there's, if there are treatments that can successfully accomplish both of those, I think those would be big advances in the Alzheimer's field. And uh, that's what we're trying to do, in fact, with our uh, program. Wonderful. Well, I can't wait to learn more. I will hop in and say one of my big beliefs in terms of watching my mom 
And then, you know, working with so many people living with the disease um, since I stepped into this industry and anyone will have a hard time convincing me otherwise, even though I have no research behind it. But the impact of social engagement, I think, is so massively huge, where people feel it's okay to participate, and they're encouraged to participate. And one of the things I hear over and over and over and over again from them is they never felt this kind of purpose in their life prior to the disease, and they feel they're helping others, and they feel like it it kind of stays off their symptoms for that period of time when they're active and helping and not that they won't collapse after they've done a conference (laughs) and work so hard at getting up on stage to be present and and be able to be understood Um, that can kind of wipe them out for a few days but they said it just is it's so prevalent in the people that I talk with um in that story hasn't changed. And I, I, it's just amazed me time and time again. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you're touching on a really important theme, which not, um, a couple of themes. I mean, obviously the social interaction has profound effects on how our brains function and our brain health. Um, and um, we, we don't even begin to understand the impact of social interaction on a biological level, but the, it's cl- pretty clear that it has a profound effect. But the, the flip side of that is, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna touch on something that you just mentioned, which is the idea that people can do something for themselves is really profound, um, both in terms of how they live every day and activities, but, um, when and in a minute we'll talk about our technology. Um, our 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 treatment is one that's uh, a medical device that people use themselves. And the idea of doing something for yourself with a medical device, um, in other words, administering and being part of the treatment of yourself, is 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 a departure from being given something and just taking it. And um, I think that may have a very motivating effect on Al- Alzheimer's in particular, um, but may have some therapeutic benefit in, in and of itself of the idea of um, self-help, self-efficacy, being in control of one's one's health, I think are really important uh, concepts and and um, are, 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 you know, maybe, maybe a derivative of what we're trying to do at Cognito. Well, and I think in, on top of doing it for yourself, it takes away that sense of being a burden to someone else adding because they stress about that stuff that everything falls onto the care partner. And so that, and that's another thing that I hear from people all the time. When my stress is down, my symptoms are down. And so I've always found that very interesting in and of itself too. Well, let's, let's talk about, you know, what your company does as a whole Great. So uh, we're we're developing a non-invasive home-based medical device technology, and that's a mouthful. Uh, and for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, so people use a device for an hour a day. Uh, they usually do it in the morning, uh, and we've administered over forty thousand treatment sessions so far across many clinical studies, and. Uh, People uh, people accommodate their daily routine to uh, to carve out the hour that they need for their treatment, and they uh, usually sit in a comfortable chair in their living room, uh, usually in the morning. And uh, we do involve the care partner as well to um, uh, almost as a coach to remind uh, remind the uh, patient that it's time to uh, to have their treatment. And um, and keep an eye keep an eye on them. And we also ask in our clinical trials, we ask the care partner to make observations about how someone is functioning, and th- those observations are very very insightful. So so that's our that's our basic technology. It delivers um, uh, light and sound stimulus, and this is a sensory stimulation. Um, and it induces, the sensory stimulation induces 
uh, a predictable electrical response in the brain. And we confirm that electrical response with a test called an electroencephalogram. There's an abbreviation called EEG for that. And uh, so we confirm that these electrical oscillations occur and the electrical oscillations occur time locked with the visual and auditory stimulus. So in other words, it's, it's like a conductor in an orchestra, so to speak. And um, we, as, as we confirm this EEG response in each person who uses the device, we confirm an important concept in uh, treatment, which is called proof of target engagement. So we prove that each person will have the required electrical response in their brain. And we do that at the onset of treatment. And if someone doesn't have the electrical response, they're not eligible for our treatment. That's a very small minority, but we don't want people who can't benefit from the treatment to use it. Also, uh, when we do that first test with the EEG, we ask people um, if they're having any adverse events, and sometimes people spontaneously report adverse events. And we don't want someone to use the treatment if they don't tolerate it. And again, it's a very small proportion of those who try the treatment who can't tolerate it. But again, it's better to know that up front than to start and then have to stop um, later. Um, we track the uh, use of the device uh, over time because the device is connected to the cell towers. So we can monitor you know, the time that the treatment is started and the time that the treatment is stopped. And we want people to use it for an hour a day. You can't use it for more than that because it has an auto, auto stop function. So it won't allow you to use it for more than one hour a day because that's the prescribed treatment. Um, and um, so you might want to ask me, how does this induced electrical activity modify Alzheimer's disease? Well, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> uh, and uh, if that's the one you want me to answer, I'll, I will answer that. <laughs> oh, definitely. Uh, definitely. I would, uh, And I like that it automatically turns itself off so people can't overuse it. Could they, but one question before you answer uh, the other was, can they come back periodically during the day and say, okay, I'm going to do 20 minutes here and then I'm going to do 20 minutes after lunch and is that possible too, it, even if it, it's not ideal? It's <laughs> it's 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 not ideal. <laughs> uh, we want we want a one hour um, we want a one hour session, and we've we've actually um, looked very carefully at our previous clinical trial, and we saw that um, the adherence or the appropriate you know one hour per day use, approximately one hour per day use. It's there about 85% of the time. So uh, people are pretty good about um, adhering to their treatment. Um, the, the other thing is that in that first session, when people use the device for the first time, the technologist who comes and does the EEG testing adjusts the some, some of the stimulation parameters to optimize the EEG response. So the device is optimized for each person. And there's a range of uh, stimulus intensity that uh, will produce that desired response, the so-called gamma oscillations. And uh, when, when people get the device, they can adjust the strength of the stimulation within a preset range. So for example, um, if they felt it was too strong one day, they could bring the intensity down a little bit. And sometimes people are more sensitive on some days than others to light and sound. Um, so we allow that, that optimization function both at the beginning and then during the treatment. We find that once people set the device to uh, a range of activity that is comfortable for them, they generally leave it. And most of the adjustments happen in the first few weeks. And then after that, people mostly leave the device settings alone and just go back and do their one hour per day uh, standard treatment. Does this like plug in like a cell phone where they have to, you know, charge it overnight or? So it does, it does need to be recharged. So there is a charging cable and there's a, there's a controller unit. There's um, 
uh, glasses and headphones. And we're obviously working on a much sleeker uh, design for a commercial use, but this is the one that we're using in the clinical trial. So it does have to be, it does have to be plugged in. So um, there are, there, you know, the, the battery is quite good, but it, it does, it does need electricity. Okay. So are, are both of these plugged into another piece of equipment then, or? They connect into the controller unit, which is just a handheld controller, which is similar to um, a TV controller, for example. Okay. And then with the, with the sound, what types of things are they hearing? Are they hearing people talk to them or is it pinging sounds like they're out in the universe? Or these, are, what, these, what are, these, are, these are just repetitive, mm -hmm. um, yeah, repetitive stimulation at a certain frequency. So it's, um, yeah, you don't, it's, it wouldn't be someone speaking or music. It would be a repetitive, uh, and it's almost like a tone. Okay. And then as far as what they're, are they seeing a picture or is it different types of light or one type of light that's, that they're looking at? Yeah, it's, it's light flashes. So in other words, um, yeah, both, both this, both the sound and the visual are, 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 um, are not like someone's voice or, or music, for example, it wouldn't be that. Okay. So when they have these glasses on, this is going to sound really dumb, but do they have their eyes open to see these flashes or can they keep them closed and still get the same effect? Good, good question. So the current model that we're using in the clinical trial is a closed view. In other words, they, 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 they almost look like sunglasses, dark sunglasses uh, where you can't see through. Uh, but we're de we're developing other um, models where there'll be open view where people will be able to see through. But those are not the ones that we're testing right now in the uh, clinical trial. Okay. So when I was referring to open or closed, I was referring to like if I had them on, would my eyes eyelids be open or closed, and would I get the same benefit either way? Um, so the eyes, the eyes should be open, but um, it actually can get through the eyelids because uh, light, light gets through our eyelids into the back mm -hmm. of our eye. But we ask people to keep their eyes open um, and to and, and, and to rest during the hour um, in a comfortable chair. Um, and you know, I, it's it's hard to do activities obviously if there is a closed closed lens you can't see through and we want people to stay in a safe place for for the period of treatment okay because i just thought well if if i'm relaxed and i think the older i get the more relaxed i get I, i'm comfortable just going to sleep you know and so i'm wondering if that's an issue with people falling well, we ask, asleep yeah good question we ask people to stay awake um we don't want them to get too comfortable and uh and uh we we also involve the care partner in keeping keeping an eye on their uh, their loved one to make sure that um, they they stay awake during the treatment session. Okay, so they'll just poke them if they start snoring and, <laughs> and bounce them back awake. Yeah, I guess there's different there's different methods of keeping someone awake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's just I, I find it interesting. Um, and it's nice that, that they can do something like that at home. Is this, uh, how long is the treatment for, you know, for the clinical trial that they're in? So it's an hour a day. The, the current clinical trial is 12 months. Okay. And the, um, the final assessment is after 12 months. In the previous study that we did, um, the, there was a comparison between the treatment and um, a device that doesn't that doesn't generate uh, same device, but the stimulation parameters that don't generate the electrical activity. So that was for six months, and then we did another twelve months where everybody was allowed to switch to the the active treatment. So it can be uh, we we have eighteen months of experience now. In the current study, we'll have twelve months. And then we'll see some people may continue after with um, another year of treatment if if they choose to. Okay. And then would they keep the equipment or just keep it for however long they're in the trial for and then return the equipment? 
Well, uh, yeah. So in a clinical trial, you, you're supposed to only use the device during the clinical trial, not not beyond. Um, obviously, um, we're hoping to generate um, data uh, in the clinical trial that would help us with a regulatory submission to have this as an approved therapy. At that point, we'll have other discussions to see how people should continue with treatment, there may be a different version of the device at that time. So we'll have all those discussions down the road. Okay. And is this considered bioelectrical medicine? Great question. So this is, this is, you know, this is um, an, a sensory stimulation device that delivers, that generates electrical activity in the brain. So it generates a physical uh, event in the brain, which is electrical. Uh, in a way, it's biophysical. I think that that's a fair, fair statement. But the biophysical stimulus leads to biological changes in the brain. So we know that uh, some of the pathways that are involved in protecting brain cells, in um, uh, repairing brain cells, or uh, preserving or maintaining the lining around nerves, the so so-called myelin in the brain, um, are very much affected by this electrical activity. And we've been able to demonstrate this in previous studies a couple of ways. One is that in one study, we took samples of the spinal fluid uh, at baseline before the treatment started, and then after eight weeks. And in the spinal fluid, using very special um, measurement techniques, we're able to show that uh, some of the uh, proteins that are involved in protecting neurons, in uh, repairing some the connections between neurons, the so-called synapses, and also in um, the proteins that are involved in making myelin in a cell called oligodendrocytes, that those have very significant um, changes. And we'll be describing those this year at a scientific meeting. The other, the other way that we've shown how this biophysical uh, treatment generates um, biological effects is by using MRI scans. And we, we, use, um, we use the MRI scans to measure the uh, brain structures. So we look at the so-called gray matter and we look at the white matter in the brain. We can look at them separately and we can look at them uh, for the whole brain or in parts of the brain. And what we've seen um, is a remarkable reduction in brain atrophy, which I think at the outset of this, this, um, this conversation today, you mentioned how profound brain atrophy can be in Alzheimer's disease. And we've seen um, on the brain structure side in our phase two study, we've seen um, over 70% reduction in brain atrophy um, over over six months, and we have some evidence now that that continues into the um, uh, beyond the study and people who continued the treatment. And the thing that's really remarkable is that um, that reduction in the rate of brain atrophy parallels the reduction in uh, the rate of loss of function, <clears throat> so-called activities of daily living. And then we've looked at um, statistically, uh, the relationship between um, the preservation of function and preservation of structure. And we've seen some very interesting statistical relationships between them, suggesting that they move together. So this, this is a unique uh, way of delivering a treatment which can be given at home, produces a biophysical response, as you describe, that translates into a biological response um, that is understood in terms of, you know, neuroprotection and preservation of myelin and white matter and gray matter in the brain. And that um, leads to uh, measurable changes in function and in the MRI structure. So that, that's why we're really excited about this. And of course, um, you know, we, we believe that these exciting observations need to be confirmed in a large properly conducted phase three trial, which is what we're doing now. And uh, this is a huge opportunity to not only learn a lot about Alzheimer's disease, but confirm 
what we've seen before and hopefully bring a new treatment to people with, uh, with this condition. Wow, that's a, a huge um, decrease in the atrophy. Um, uh, unbelievable. And I love that there's that correlation between the two. This is a very different approach versus take a pill, you know, or, or get an infusion. What are you seeing from people who are part of the, the trial? Um, are there any comments in terms of their feeling for this, this uh, alternative approach? to the disease? Yeah, you know, every every treatment has a burden. Um, and uh, the burden of uh, some of the other treatment approaches is, is different. So for example, when people take pills or injections, they have to have a lot of lab testing to make sure that there's not an effect on the liver or the kidney or some other body function. We, we haven't seen any lab abnormalities on this treatment. So that's, that's a burden that um, people don't have. Um, there is a very specific burden in Alzheimer's disease. Um, there's a condition called uh, amyloid related imaging abnormalities or area. And you may have talked about this in some of your other other with some of your other speakers. Um, so we've delivered over 40,000 uh, treatment sessions. We've not seen a single case of ARIA or ARIA. So we believe that we can we can avoid that um, that aspect of the uh, Alzheimer treatment. Um, and um, the other thing is that receiving treatment at home um, adds a different dimension. Uh, there are many, many caregivers with Alzheimer's disease who um, have a hard time bringing their loved ones to the hospital because mm -hmm. it's it's really not that simple to go for a hospital appointment. Um, the waiting time is quite long. There's a lot of time. There's travel time. Um, generally speaking, people have to take a day off to do it. It's not, it's not part of a day. It's usually most of the day. And uh, so we think that a home-based treatment is very important. Um, the other the other aspect that we've tried to incorporate in our clinical trial, which is now um, enrolling um, uh, people with Alzheimer's disease uh, with our treatment, um, is to try to minimize the number of clinic visits. So we do a lot of the assessments at home. Uh, obviously, the treatment is administered at home. Because there's less laboratory test monitoring, there's less visits to the hospital to have a blood test or a, a you know, a follow-up MRI scan to look for something like area. So we're trying to minimize the burden and make this as holistic a treatment as possible, while at the same time having the same rigor of a biologic treatment in terms of the study measures are the same as the large uh, drug trials, the imaging um, intensity and the way we the way we measure the MRI scans is exactly the same. Um, and the way we select people for the trial is also uh, as rigorous. So we require that we confirm Alzheimer's disease. So we use a blood test um, in lieu of a PET scan. Um, if someone has a positive PET scan, then that's fine. But if they haven't had a PET scan, they can have a blood test and something called PTAU-181. And it has a very strong predictive, uh, uh, very strong prediction of Alzheimer's pathology. So in other words, it can predict who has amyloid and who, who doesn't. So we use that to try also to try to limit the burden on uh, patients. So it, our study does not require a PET scan. Um, if someone has it, we will use that information, but it doesn't, it doesn't require it. The treatment burden is is much less. Um, it does require a commitment of one hour a day of quiet time, um, not too quiet, but quiet enough. <laughs> and um, and then um, the uh, uh, people generally, you know, fold it into their routine. Um, you know what what's exciting. What also is different is that I mentioned earlier that we've seen these concordant or parallel changes in structure and function. We think that looking at both how somebody functions and how their brain performs is, um, and looks is, is very important. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to repeat the results of our phase 
two study called Overture in our phase three study, which we call Hope. And um, I'm happy to tell you more about the, the study we're doing right now. I, I would love to hear that. Love to hear that. Great. So we're the HOPE study is a phase three trial. So um, participants who meet the inclusion criteria, uh, which include the uh, the blood test for Alzheimer's, the PTAL 181 test, uh, are then uh, randomly assigned to receive the active treatment or a sham treatment using the same device. So everybody does the same one hour treatment a day. And uh, it's a one year study. Uh, we hope to... Uh, again, confirm what we've seen in the phase two trial. And um, for, we're currently at um, somewhere between 50 to 60 clinical trial sites across the United States. So it's there are clinical trial sites close to most people with Alzheimer's disease, but not everyone. Uh, so, you, you know, you can get more information about the trial from a website that we have, and I can, I can spell it out for you if you want me to do that. It's... Um, it's www.hopestudyforad.com. So that's uh, hope study for F O R and then A and D.com. So that's our hope study platform. On it, um, there's ways of getting more information, there's ways of seeing if one qualifies. The inclusion criteria are on the website. And we also have a very, we have a wonderful team. So there's a way of calling in and asking questions and seeing if one meets the criteria for the trial. Not everybody does, but it's certainly worth, um, it's certainly worth a look. Um, and we, uh, we're actively enrolling uh, uh, people across the United States right now, and we'll be doing so for probably till next May or June, um, then we'll close enrollment at that time. Yeah, so it's very exciting times. You know, one of the things I hear from people is the frustration of trying to figure out if they qualify or not. Do you have kind of like the the top things, like in terms of what stage of Alzheimer's disease they would have to be in if it's early, mid, or late? And can they have a mixed diagnosis is another one uh, that is a, a common thing. Um, or sometimes it can be if they've got heart disease or diabetes seems to knock them out as well. Can you, can you address some of those things? Absolutely. So we have a pretty wide range of Alzheimer's that um, is included in the clinical trial. Um, we use something called the mini mental status exam or MMSE. So the range of MMSE for this trial is from 15 through 28. So it's pretty broad compared to many other trials. So 15 to 20 is considered moderate Alzheimer's disease and 21 to 28 is considered mild Alzheimer's disease. Um, the, there is a requirement to confirm the amyloid um, status. So that can either be a prior test uh, that someone had done with their doctor, or if that's not available, we do a blood test for PTAL 181, which is a marker a blood marker for amyloid status. Um, the uh, exclusion criteria also also require that um, there aren't other competing neurological diseases. So things like strokes, seizures um, would confuse um, would confuse the measurements, and obviously they're they're not included. Uh, but um, there aren't many. Um, there, there aren't many um, exclusion, exclusionary criteria similar to some of the anti-amyloid therapies. So I think it's worth taking a look uh, if, if you know of someone that has Alzheimer's disease or if you want to be included, considered for inclusion in the trial, um, have a look on the website. Uh, there also are screeners. So if you do, do want more information, someone can call you and find out if you have the right criteria for the trial. And um, it does require uh, a caregiver. So you need somebody, a care partner, someone who will, you know, be there to, um, to make sure that the treatment's being used properly. And, um, and also we do ask the care partner's assessment of how someone's doing. And as you know, when you look after somebody with Alzheimer's disease, you may see things about the person with the condition that they don't see. So 
I think that, you know, doing cognitive testing on the person with Alzheimer's disease and having the, having the care partner um, describe their function is are two really important aspects of the disease. And uh, that's, that's, that is the way most Alzheimer's trials are being done now. Uh, it's definitely a requirement by the regulatory agencies that both cognition and function are, are both um, relevant and important uh, aspects of the disease that need to be assessed uh, for uh, to really get a full picture of how someone's doing. Okay. And is there any cost? I know with some um, trials, everything is picked up through the trial. Others I've heard, well, you'll pay this through your insurance for different testing and stuff. How does that work? No, we, we cover the trial costs. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Wonderful. Well, this sounds really exciting. We'll have to have you back when you guys are all said and done with this and hear what the results are. Um, I just, uh, I love seeing the different approaches to this and seeing, you know, more and more people are referring to dementia being almost cancer-like with all these subsets of diseases underneath it. And they all take their own little twists and turns and, and treatment protocols you know, with that. And I, I, I find that very exciting that it's not all just under one umbrella, um, which it's been for quite a while, in my yeah. opinion, as a non-profe- non-professional. <laughs> well, that's a very valid, it's a very valid statement that you're making. And, you know, we think that the tide is rising for Alzheimer's right now, that there've been some really remarkable successes. Some of our uh, colleagues at companies that are developing am- anti-amyloid therapies have have really advanced the field and created um, hope in people with Alzheimer's disease and their family and their families that this is not an irretrievable situation, that there are treatment options, that it's really a question of having the courage to test those treatment options. You know, we we are incredibly thankful to uh, the patients with Alzheimer's disease and their families who agree to participate in this clinical trial. They're they're really the driving force for our uh, for our advancement in this condition. And without people participating in the clinical trials, we would never we would never learn about this disease. We wouldn't develop new treatments. And uh, so the the tide is rising. People are getting activated. I think a lot of the work that you're doing is really activating people. So that's wonderful. And we're, uh, we think the glass is half full. So uh, that's, that's, that's how we're working on this. And we hope to have some good news. Uh, One thing that you should do is as we release more analysis of our phase two data this year and next year, stay tuned. And, um, you know, if you, uh, if you want us to come back and talk about our, our learnings, we're happy, we're happy to do that and, uh, you know, contribute to the great cause that you're driving here. Wonderful. Well, we'd love to have you back because we like to keep updated on, on what's going on. Um, in wrapping up, I, I hope our listeners have found this conversation that we've had with Ralph Kern, the um, chief medical officer. Uh, we've learned a lot. We've covered, I think, an awful lot of ground here, and uh, especially on how you can get involved with the HOPE study as well. Uh, as Ralph said, you, you know, without, without you, without the people living with the disease, we're not going to find a cure. We're not going to find a treatment. Uh, if we aren't able to test out different theories. So you can go to that HOPE study website, which is HOPE study for, and that's spelled out F-O-R and then ad.com. You can go to their website, which is um, C-O-G-N-I-T-O-T-X.com. And then you can find Ralph Kern, um, on LinkedIn. So be a giver of hope, like, click and share. You don't know who in your sphere of influence is in need of this information. And the more information we have ahead of time, before we actually need it, uh, the calmer we'll all be and the better we'll be able to decipher this information. So again, uh, to our listeners, thank you so much for being part of our community. And Ralph, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.
Again, I just want to add, uh, don't forget to check out alzheimerspeaks.com and check out all those free resources we have, as well as our children's book, Betty the Bald Chicken, Lessons in How to Care, and then Dementia Map. That's our global resource directory. We'll talk soon, everyone. Bye now.